Hmm. August 29th, 2016, Edible Lakers, here at Edible Lakers 2, um, where we've done a whole bunch of videos, you know, on the cattle panel greenhouse and making charcoal with um, a hot tub and all sorts of other experimental things. All of our chicken videos come from this site. This is like our second site, 0.6 acres, where my partner Sasha and I live. Uh, she's been here for almost 10 years and we've been farming this together. This is uh, representing three years of farming. I thought it'd be fun to actually go into the garden and really look around a little bit. Uh, I've done snapshots of strafaria flushes and different ideas here and there, but never actually just like a general tour of the garden. Um, well, you can see, here's our home. This is where I had my little $15 greenhouse in the past. Uh, we'll be making an all glass greenhouse out of that material there a little later. There'll be a video on that for sure. And so this is facing east and now facing south. That's south. So we're on a, <clears throat> it's an interesting site. We're on a north facing slope, not incredibly steep or anything, but we're almost 1200 foot elevation, north facing slope. There's a ton of trees around and this is probably one of the wettest sites I've ever been <laughs> trying to grow things. A lot of the year round, uh, you dig down a few inches and it fills with water almost immediately. So not, just kind of the theme with all edible acres things, it's not starting with the easiest soils, but with enough raised bed making and organic matter addition and hugel mounds and all the fun stuff that's kind of built into the idea of farming with permaculture methods, the this space is actually starting to explode with food. It's pretty exciting. Um, at some point, if there's interest, maybe let me know in the comments if there's interest for me to go a little bit more in depth, both with the raised bed creation and also like some of the perennial elements that are in here. But I just thought it'd be fun to wander and give you an idea of what this garden looks like. So it's all raised beds. And some are not very, very raised. Some are more raised. Some are very, very raised, and a lot of it is about just digging down into the pathways and then throwing that soil up into the gardens. There's no wood in here to hold the beds together, and the nice thing about that is it allows us to make the shapes of these beds whatever we want. So this is a long crescent moon shape, and this one's a little heart shape in here. There's some straight line beds to facilitate. You can see Sasha wants to keep the poke root. <laughs> I'm the one that does the weeding, so we'll have to see how long this one lasts. But you, know, you can see some of the beds are straight and built around the idea. So here's four feet wide by probably about 12 feet long. And these are half inch EMT metal uh, conduit pipes that I put through a hoop bender. And we can put poly over these tunnels over these beds very easily. So we've got some fennel in here, we'll probably transplant in some other things. And to give a season extension, we can be eating fennel pretty deep into the winter once we get poly over this. So some of the beds are a little bit more straightforward. Uh, and then a lot just have all sorts of different shapes to them. And as you can see, it, it feels feral, and I think that that's reasonable to say. You know, there's seed heads all over the place. Um, these were all of our salad greens that we picked from all throughout the spring. Whole mix of bib and salanova and Italian oak leaf. And seed saving is a really huge part of what we do. Um, so we're letting these ripen up just a little longer. It's kind of playing with fire because we're going to end up with carpets of lettuce in the fall. But maybe that's, that's actually not a bad thing. Um, but it makes for a little bit more of an unkempt kind of feral space, but also really beautiful. I mean, this is kind of a stunning little scene right here with the red Russian kales going and then lettuces on the side. There's scallions squirting up and out from the edges and some chamomile coming through in there and then really nice block of chard doing its thing. This is an incredibly exciting herb or green for us called a gretti, salsoda soda. That's uh, almost, it's almost like a land-based seaweed. 
it accumulates salt in the soil. And our well water tends to have a tiny hint of a salt flavor. And so we thought having all this agretti in here might be nice to soak up the salt. Um, when Sasha cooks with it, it ends up being a lot of times the salt source for our dish. Uh, and it really thrives here. These actually overwinter, well, they drop seed and then come back. And by not really interrupting that process and allowing it to do it, we got to learn how viable it is as a crop here. So um, agretti and malochia and samphire and all sorts of really funky different greens and herbs get to grow here so we can learn about them. These old Italian purple beans that we found to be really tasty, fresh eating but also cooked, and they're also good as a dried bean. And then we've got medicinal herbs growing, so we just took a first harvest of lemon balm a few weeks ago, and they just look so beautiful once you take that harvest and they rebound from it. Then there's amaranths and things that have just kind of overwintered. We've got some squashes really cranking. And then we've used the fence. So this fence was installed a bunch of years ago to keep the dogs in the yard. And it works, works well for that. And it also really works well for keeping deer out. And we're using it as a trellis this year to grow all of our tomatoes. So probably have canned, oh, 10 gallons of sauce for the winter so far. We're at late August. And it's actually now just beginning to become peak season. So we're probably going to get 20 to 30 gallons, 40 gallons of sauce out of this fence. It's, you know, again, unruly, unkempt. Did a little bit of weaving here and there just to keep the vines from falling too, too much on the ground. Could have certainly pruned a lot more and cleaned a lot more, but um, it's, it's working pretty well. We put in about a 50 plants here couple more plants at Edible Acres and they're really loving it. The hope will be to do uh, a few more really serious rounds of canning and then once we have some transplants for the fall that can live into the winter to actually pull all the tomato plants and get them into a nice hot compost so that we don't kind of drag it out and have the option of late blight settling in later on. So far it's been pretty clean, but um, and you can see they're all along the whole fence line. They're all along our garden or our uh, greenhouse over there. And of course you get weeds like this. It's pretty beautiful. Amaranth is awesome at being a weed. <laughs> so is shiso. So shiso is a perilla. It's a really beautiful plant, but also a great herb to cook with. And we use it a lot. We're finding tulsi is starting to naturalize a little bit here. It comes up each year. Now I'm pulling a blank on... So wet... Wetland crop, and for some reason I'm pulling a blank on what it is. But it's perennial and it comes back surprisingly well here. We've got little micro ponds dug all throughout. They're empty now because this is we're still in the historically droughtiest year since 1892. But those are generally pretty full, as you can tell by the bone set and the cattails, and generally teeming with frogs. So that's fun. Um, and then tons and tons of Tulsi production, which we dry and save for herb, dried herb in the fall and winter. A lot of chard, some of this for the chickens. It's one of their favorite greens, so we just crack off any that are slightly ugly, you know, like something like this. I'll crack right off and send into the chicken yard so that we get these really luscious green beauties. It's such a generous crop. Once the chard is done, we'll leave the leeks in the middle and enjoy those into the fall and winter. And again, more Tulsi, more amaranth, there's okra. There's, you know, over a hundred different uh, annuals and perennials in here. Although this is a little bit more of an annual-focused garden, since we're here more. There's some summer squash. <laughs> Overripe, for sure. But that'll go to the chickens, so we can catch up with it. And then we've got some cold frames for doing season extension, as well as seed starting in the spring. And, um... So, I don't I just think it's worth noting, uh... This, we started gardening in here in earnest in the spring of 2013. And this is 
August 2016. So this is what can happen converting a mowed lawn into a garden in just three years. Um, two more years, three more years from now, I could imagine it being way more fertile, way more productive. There's a ton of wood chips that haven't fully broken down. There are manures that haven't been fully integrated. Um, but for those of you that have a lawn, this is 0.6 acres that we're on. And this garden is, oh, I don't even know, not even 0.1 acre, maybe 0.1. And a um, few hundred dollars between, you know, the EMT metal, truckloads of wood chips, truckloads of manure, hay, that kind of stuff. Certainly a few, you know, $150 for our greenhouse, and, you know, 50 bucks or so for all those. But, but basically, whatever the financial investment for this, it paid for itself in organic, high-quality produce within the first season. Now we're in year three. We have such an abundance, we could be selling this produce to restaurants, we could be catering, we could be doing our own pop-up restaurant based on the abundance of food that's coming out of here. And this runs entirely without gas-powered machines, there's no electricity involved in growing all this. We don't even use a well to water this. This is entirely based on rainwater collection and thoughtful earthworks, you know, small ponds and swales and redirection and all that. So, the concept of food not lawns, incredibly viable. <laughs> you know, we're untrained, it's just figure it out as we go, watching YouTube videos, going on permies.com, trying stuff, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, making adjustments. So, moral of this story, this is your backyard if you want it to be. This is your front yard if you want it to be. If you have no formal training, very little available funds, basic hand tools, and no real access to uh, infrastructure, you can have this garden. So have it. <laughs> Maybe you already do. And if you do, share videos of what you're doing. I'd love to see them. I'd love to hear notes. If you need help to try to figure this out and you're in the Finger Lakes area, contact me. I do consultation and training and hands-on and all sorts of stuff. But really, you can be doing this. And we'll do more videos as things go along. But uh, you get the sense of how abundant it can be where you live, in your backyard, without a whole lot. Anyway, thanks for watching. This is one of my longer videos. apologize for that, but hopefully it was worthwhile. Do one last pan, and we'll call it good. There you go. That's what we see from the kitchen every morning. Not too bad. Better than a lawn. A little lawn for the dogs and microgreens for the chickens will take it. A little push mower, a little real mower takes care of that in about 15 minutes once a week. Okay, now I'll say thanks for watching. Goodbye.